So, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to our fourth week of our six-week introduction to mindfulness class. And um, as we did last week, uh, if you'd like to start with some questions, it might be nice. Some people are coming in late, so it gives them a chance to arrive. Any questions or comments about uh, the instruction so far or about your own experience applying it? I find when I start, I'm nice and erect and very in, in focus, and then as I'm kind of meditating, I'm, so I find myself just kind of rounding down. Is it better as you, you know, go back into your focus to go ahead and straighten up your spine again? I assume that's what I should be doing. Uh, yeah, it's good to have a straight spine, and there's a certain uh, element of mindfulness that's required uh, to focus on your posture and keep your posture erect. However, if you're uh, straightening up every minute or two, you know, then it's not so useful. You know, uh, maybe twice or three times in the course of half an hour, maybe it's okay. If it's happening more than that, then maybe what you want to do is let yourself slump over and then uh, apply mindfulness to that. Okay. And notice what's going on. Do you tend to slump when the mind is uh, getting dull or, or sleepy? Or when you, you're getting, getting lulled by calm? Or are you getting complacent? Or you, is your mind drifting a lot into thoughts? Kind of notice what's going on around the time around the time that you're um, you are um, slumping, okay. and uh, you might get the information you need to find out how to sharpen up the effort, the attention. Thank you. The um, uh, now it's po- it's possible to uh, meditate quite successfully with uh, completely slouched over posture. In Burma, maybe I said this earlier, but in Burma, uh, men tend to meditate like this. And they get enlightened. So, uh, and, in, and the women, they meditate like this. It's kind of like you know, it's, you know, the old way of riding horses. It wasn't women had to be more womanly, you know, it's in the side, side. So it's kind of like this. So women have one foot behind them, like this, when they meditate. But the effect of this is that it forces the body up. And so the women in Burma, they sit with great dig- dignity. And one of the great the sights of my life was in the monastery I was in, there were uh, um, um, this huge uh, women's meditation hall. And there were, um, because it's a hot climate, two sides of uh, two whole walls were uh, basically open. You can see right through. And I'd go, in the morning, I'd go to my breakfast. I had to walk right by the women's meditation hall. And there were 500 women in there meditating, all in rows. And 500 women all sitting up with tremendous strength and dignity. It was, I was so inspired by it. I was never inspired by the men. <laughs> and uh, it's also uh, well worth uh, cultivating mindful, enough mindfulness of the body to keep the, back, the, uh, the spine straight. And what will happen is, at some point or other, um, um, the mindfulness, the, the, the meditation energy, or whatever, the tension, concentration will click, uh, kick in. And you'll find it effortless to keep your back straight. And, and until the, the energy kind of is, uh, is, uh, is uh, awakened, you have to kind of um, uh, keep using your mindfulness to stay straight and upright. But once it's awakened, you know, you're not going to slump anymore. So what we're doing, uh, what I'm trying to convey in this class, is how to use attention effectively in a useful way so that our attention can help us not get caught by life, by experiences. Our attention can help us become freer of whatever happens and goes on with us. And attention operates this way when we pay careful attention to what's going on. And there's two ways in which careful attention and mindfulness is freeing. One way it's, uh, it's freeing is that you we begin seeing actually what's going on and we can see the ways that we're caught, the way we're holding on, the way we're resisting. And the seeing of that clearly helps then we can release it. We can let go or we begin letting go or softening around it. That's one way. So if I see that I'm clenching my fist, if I really know I'm doing that, I can release it. I remember once I was at the UC library uh, desk uh, trying to get a book which was not on the shelf but had been returned and they weren't cooperating to look for it. And um, we were kind of heated. I don't know heated exactly but I was pretty adamant I wanted that book and when the, finally the person left to go check the back rooms, I pay, and then I paid attention to my posture. And I was leaning over the desk, way over. And I, I hadn't known it. 
And so as soon as I saw it, then I, I you know, straightened up and got my feet back on the floor. And so as you see something, you can hopefully let go, begin the process of letting go. Letting go isn't always easy, but you can begin. The other, so one is to see it. The other is um, the act of atten- attention itself, mindfulness itself, is, doesn't cling. It just, uh, it's a, in a, way, a very simple, open awareness. And as you develop your awareness stronger, you get a sense of this awareness which is free of what you're aware of. If I'm clench, clenching, holding on to something really tight and I'm really concerned about this thing I'm holding on to, when I pay attention to it, the attention, chances are, gets entangled with my desire. And so it's kind of in there, kind of with it, and I can't see them as two different things. But as the mindfulness gets stronger, you start seeing that mindfulness is separate from what you're mindful of. Awareness is different from what you're aware of. And so once you start seeing that, you see that the nature of awareness is to be free, or is to be independent of what is known. And so that's a second way that the mindfulness practice gives you a sense of freedom. And the advantage of the second way is that you don't have to let go in order to feel some degree of freedom or independence or spaciousness or something. Uh, and so as mindfulness gets stronger, you discover this whole other capacity, way of being. Now, mindfulness is, um, the way we, we emphasize it in our tradition, is we try to develop mindfulness to be all-inclusive, to include all aspects of our life. So to include um, you know, our, our breath and our body, our physical and body part of our life, to include our um, emotions, and to include our thoughts, to include the world around us we encounter, sights, sounds, smells, and everything. There's nothing which is meant to be outside of the scope of awareness. And we say that what makes awareness sacred in Buddhism, in Buddhism itself, awareness is the most sacred kind of thing, a reality. What makes awareness sacred is when there is no outside. There's nothing that we're excluding and saying, well, I can't pay attention to that. That's not permissible. Uh, And sometimes in Buddhism, it's called big mind, the mind that holds it all, the awareness that holds it all within it without excluding or shutting down or closing off or pushing away anything at all. That doesn't mean that we don't say no to things. It doesn't mean we don't act in the world in ways to protect ourselves. But we don't allow the awareness or the open heart to close down, even if we might say no to something. So uh, when there was a, in the 60s, there was an uh, American who was practicing this practice, mindfulness, in uh, India. And uh, someone tried to, uh, someone, someone attacked her in the streets of India. Uh, some guy, and she managed to break free and run away. And um, she went to her meditation teacher and said, what should I have done? And he said, with all the loving kindness you could muster up, you hit the fellow over the head with your umbrella. <laughs> So I don't necessarily recommend hitting people over the head, but the principle was that you could have an open heart or an open mind, open awareness, while you make choices in the world about how to act. It's act. You might, you might say no like this to someone, lock your door, but you don't, you don't close your heart or your awareness to it. So in Buddhism, get a really, to get a really good sense of this ability to put the attention, awareness to be free and open, include everything, um, uh, is considered to be sacred part of the sacred realm. And a big part of practice, uh, we, dis- we discover that through the strengthening of mindfulness, where the mindfulness gets stronger and stronger, that it's, it's set free from what you're mindful of. And so probably what you'll find, what you have found, is that if you have strong sensations in your body, pain in your body, you're, you're, you know, you're, we react to that. We're against it. We, cl- we, we clench around it. We try to push away. We have all these feelings of self-pity or anger or despair. All kinds of things go on. And all those strong reactions become um, kind of connected or entangled with our sense of paying attention to it, being aware of it. But as mindfulness gets stronger, um, the mindfulness itself begins to stand separate from or independent from all that. The analogy that's used in Buddhism is that of a lotus flower, that a lotus flower um, grows up out of the muddy water, but as it blooms, is untouched by the mud. So you have this beautiful white lotus that is you know, sparkling clean. It's, it's rooted in the mud, but it's not touched by the mud. It has this purity. So the, as, as the mindfulness, as the awareness gets stronger and stronger, it has a feeling of being lifted out or becoming free from uh, 
you know, the mud, the places of attachment and clinging and all that. So in the spirit of being all inclusive, a very important part of mindfulness is the world of our thinking. And there are certainly uh, meditators who have aversive relationships to their thoughts. There are schools of meditation where thoughts are considered distractions and you have to somehow shut them down and quiet them down, not have any thoughts. In the popular mind, sometimes meditation is uh, understood to, the aim of meditation sometimes is seen to be having a silent mind with no thoughts at all. And this meditation we're doing here, the aim around thoughts is to be aware of them, to include them in the awareness. And in that inclusion, with time, learn to be free of them. Uh, partly because sometimes they, they dissipate and the mind does become silent. And so, but also because the mindfulness has gotten so strong that we're not velcroed to them, we're not stuck to them, we're not caught in them. So a very important part of this practice is including thoughts, thinking, as part of the meditation practice. Um, but we need to do it in a wise way, with a certain understanding of how to do that. Um, so, uh, in order to do that, I think we should do it through meditation. So why don't you take a meditative posture? Gently close your eyes and give some attention to your spine and then maybe sit up a little bit straighter, more alertly than you normally would. And that more alert spine perhaps will allow you kind of a core or a inner strength or around which you can relax. So taking a few long, slow, deep breaths as you breathe in, expanding outwards, stretching your rib cage, your shoulders, back rib cage. And then as you exhale, allowing whatever possible to relax around that core of the spine, keeping the spine alert. As you exhale, softening the shoulders. As you exhale, allowing the belly to be soft as well. And as you exhale, See if you can soften the muscles of your face. And then letting your breath return to normal. And scan through your body to see if there's some way you can set your body at at ease. Staying upright with your spine, setting your body at ease. And then entering into the world of your breathing, into the way your body experiences breathing.
And for now, letting go of your thoughts and concerns so that you can better feel and sense the experience of breathing. Noticing how inhalation feels different than exhalation. And now, either letting go of your thoughts or letting them recede in the background. So in the foreground of attention, you're with your breathing. Breathing in, breathing out. giving yourself over to your breathing so that the breathing has a chance to settle you and calm you. So breathing can help center you as you center yourself around breathing. You notice that you notice yourself thinking 
For the next couple of minutes, let go of that and reestablish yourself on the breathing. And now, with a certain degree of calm and deliberation, deliberate deliberateness, let go of your breathing. Let go of paying attention to breathing. And now, simply notice when you're thinking. You're welcome to think. No need to stop thinking now. But then, as you're thinking, be clearly aware that thinking is happening. Rather than letting go of thinking, look at your thoughts directly, head on. If your thoughts fade away as you watch them, just wait until they come back or go back to your breathing until such a time that thinking begins again. And when when it does, clearly look at your thinking. See that it's happening. Be aware of it. Very, very softly whisper in the mind as you're aware of thinking occurring. Label it or name it thinking. Thinking very softly.
for the purposes of meditation, what you're thinking about is not important. But as we're paying, as we pay attention to thinking in meditation, you might notice other aspects of the process of thinking besides the content. So, for example, if you think in words or in images, what's the quality of the inner voice? What's the quality of the pictures that you see? The inner voice that thinks, is it soft and gentle? Is it harsh and adamant? Is the inner voice critical or very accepting, easygoing? Is there a lot of energy to think? Or is thinking very subtle? Are there any emotions connected to what you're thinking about? The process of thinking, is it connected or comes out of any emotion? And if there is, then quietly note the emotion. Be aware of that, include that in awareness. If thinking goes away as you watch it, relax into the space that's left behind. Relax into the spaciousness of a quiet mind. And then as you notice your thinking, notice if there's any physical side to thinking. Is there any pressure or tension connected to thinking? Somewhere in the body, tightness. Could be pressure in the brain or the forehead. Tension around the eyes or the jaws. Holding in the shoulders, the chest. Is there some part of your body that feels activated in support of the thinking or as part of your thinking?
And then is it possible for you to relax, soften any tension or pressure connected to thinking? Perhaps as you exhale, relaxing the thinking brain like you would relax a muscle. And now can you let go of your thinking enough to recenter yourself on your breathing? Letting go of your thoughts or letting them recede to the background and enter into the world of your breathing again. Hanging in there with the breathing so you can stay connected to a whole series of breaths in a row. And then taking a couple of deep breaths. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. So, imagine yourself after a busy, stressful week. You're so glad the weekend has occurred and you're going for a nice hike and you're so glad to be out. Nice hike. And you come to an edge of a river or it's a nice oak tree. You sit there next to the oak tree and have your picnic looking at the river. You perhaps take a little nap. It's beautiful weather. Nothing you need, nothing you want. You're so glad to be away from your all that busyness of your life. All that picking and running after things and doing things. It's just so good just to be there and just be content and alive and present. It's wonderful laying there in that river bank in the shade of the tree watching the river go by. And then one of those... Um, Showboats goes by, flashing lights and casinos and 
dance shows, dancers and everything. And pretty exciting. And next thing you know, you're on the boat. Not only that, but you've been on it for the last 24 hours. You didn't even know it. What happened to the riverbank? So you somehow managed to get, a sh- get ashore and make your way back up to the tree. And so happy to be back there. And you're watching the river and content. And the next thing you know, you know you're on a warship that goes by. And you've been fighting, you've been spending a couple of days fighting wars until you realize, wait a minute, how do I get onto here? And then you get back on shore, find your place in the tree again, and then this really poor, destitute kind of raft goes by. And next thing you know, you're struggling for survival in this desperate little raft. And then, how do I get on here? So you get on shore again and go back to your oak tree. And, and all these boats go by. And after a while, you think, you know, it must be a different, th- different thing to do besides always getting on every boat that goes by. Why don't, I, why don't I just watch it? So you say, I'm going to stay here in the riverbank. I'm not going to leave. Next boat comes by. I'm just going to watch it go by. I'm going to see it, the shape of it, the color of it, what's going on. I'm not going to leave my place. I'm not going to leave my seat. Just let it go by. So that analogy is sometimes used for thinking. That we establish ourselves in the shade of our breath, content and happy the best we can. And then, sooner or later, some thought floats by or gets, comes along. And we don't even see it coming. We only know after a few minutes, hours, that we're being caught up in that particular thought world. And um, a common one is planning. So the word tomorrow bubbles up in your mind and next thing you know, you're planning tomorrow. All the things you're going to do and say and eat and cook and everything. Spend a few hours planning. Or then the thought comes up about the past and then you start kind of living in the whole world of regrets or beautiful thoughts of how wonderful it was in the past. You kind of live in the world of beauty of the past. But still, you've gotten on the boat. And so, uh, much of life is lived on these boats of of thinking. And some of them are beautiful and quite appropriate and healthy to be involved in. And some of them are quite painful. cause a lot of suffering to ourselves and to others. But even when when they're healthy and good thoughts, they can also kind of carry us down the river and we lose that spot on the riverbank where we're on solid ground and stable, centered, and we can kind of be independent or free from all the things that are going on. So one of the things we're trying to do in meditation practice is to find ourselves in the riverbank where it's kind of solid with awareness and, and learn to not get onto the boats. You can't stop the boats going by, but you cannot get on. You can't, you don't, can't stop your thoughts but you can not necessarily pick them up, get involved in them. In this regard, I make a distinction between the English word thinking and a new word, thoughting. And um, thoughting is what the mind does. It produces thoughts. You can't stop the mind from thoughting. But thinking is when you get involved in your thought. And then a, a, a train of associated thinking goes on. Uh, one in one after the other, you get involved and get caught up in that world. So what we're trying to do is let the thoughts come up and, and just let them go by. It can seem uh, rather impersonal or maybe it's a little, little bit kind of uninteresting, but um, partly because, or, or, or very strange, because some people I think um, don't even know how much they're living in the world of thoughts and how much they mediate or, ex- or see or understand their life through the filter of their thinking. Um, it's kind of like they say that fish don't know, don't see the water they swim in. Humans don't see the thinking that they swim in. And, um, and so part of mindfulness is to see this huge, hugely important element of human life and to really clearly see it for what it is and then have some choice about how we relate to it. Chances are, I think most of you have not chosen much about how you relate to your thinking and how you get involved in thoughts. Some of you probably are basically a victim of your thinking mind. It takes you wherever it wants to go. And, and part of the reason for that is that some people believe who they are is their thinking. Their identity is so closely tied to what they think about 
that it's a completely foreign idea that they should be something different than their thoughts. Because if they stop thinking, then who are they going to be? Because if you don't tell yourself stories about who you are, then who are you? It can be rather a little bit challenging. So mindfulness, a hugely important part of mindfulness then is to really see the phenomenon of thinking. And we're not at war with thinking. We're not necessarily trying to push it away or stop it or say it's bad. Though some of them are painful. What we're trying to do is to uh, see it from the vantage point of the riverbank as opposed to being in it and on it. And, it, and from the vantage point of the riverbank, looking at the thinking, uh, we might start noticing things we hadn't noticed before about it. So they're different than the content, what we, what we, you know, the, the ideas that are, the thoughts or the images have. And so in this last meditation, I asked you to look a little bit. Can you, could you notice some other aspects of thinking besides the content? Could you notice if there's some emotional quality to it? If you, have, uh, if you think with the words, um, what's the tone of voice in which you think with? Um, and is there any physical aspects to your thinking? Meaning, uh, you know, if you're really churning up a lot of thoughts, you can, see, you, can, you, can, you can see it in some people's foreheads. They kind of get all bunched up. You know, their eyebrows bunch up. And you can see it. They're really thinking hard. And so there's a physical part of it. Or someone start, you ask someone to think about something that they're really worried about, and you see their shoulders go up as they really kind of bear down thinking about it. Or their, or their jaws clench up. Or you can't necessarily see it, but sometimes you can feel this kind of energetic pressure or tension maybe in the skull or inside the skull someplace. So anyway, so I try to ask you to look, ask you to look see if you notice other aspects of thinking besides the content. And to hang out just looking at thoughts. And I'll, I'm curious to hear from some of you what happened when you included thinking as part of the field of attention, when you focused on it. Because uh, mm-hmm. if you can give me some examples of some, things, some of the things that happen, then I can uh, respond, build on that. Um, so I noticed that I wasn't actually thinking, but caught in emotions. And so... You went what? Oh, I was caught in emotions. So when you said think about something, I thought I was thinking, but then realized that I was actually sort of caught in some emotional story. So, so rather than thinking, you were emoting? Yes. And or, yeah, so things were going on in my mind, but it wasn't even thoughting. It was sort of feeling something. Was feeling. Uh-huh. Great. And what, what was happening in, with thinking while you were emoting? Um, some part of me thought I was thinking, and then some part said, no, you're not actually thinking. You're, you're actually just... Going through some emotional story. Right. Good. Okay. So you, you, so you couldn't really see any, any thoughts when you kind of focused on it. Okay. Great. All right. Over here. As usual, I just start, like you said, I get on the tomorrow boat and start planning my day and I'm very kind to myself about it (laughs) so there wasn't much opportunity to look at thinking because as soon as you noticed it you were on that boat it's quite easy yeah yeah is that right yes you pulled in really easily okay so so I I, I, yeah I wish I I didn't do that but most of my thoughts are involved around planning planning yes so we'll talk more about that in a few minutes uh, but the, um, um, every time you come back from thinking, you let go of it and come back on the riverbank, every time you stop, let go or, or step back and look and, where, and just aware where I'm thinking, it can be as simple as saying to yourself, thinking, thinking. As soon as you label it as thinking, you're not as enmeshed with it as when you're not saying it. Those movements are very powerful. They only take a moment. They don't look so dramatic, but they're actually very, very big movement, movements of the mind that are beginning to break old habits. And people have spent a lifetime of, of developing a habit of just letting, letting themselves kind of ride the currents of their, of their thoughts, just fr- fr- freely, without any kind of choice, just, you know, just going along. And so, no wonder that when you sit down to meditate, the mind wanders off in thoughts so easily because it's had so much freedom over a lifetime. And it actually, the, the, relearn, the mind relearning or breaking the old habits goes relatively fast compared to how much time you spent freely thinking. It's just that we expect it to be, you know, by tomorrow. You know, it takes more than just a couple of days. But every time you notice, oh, I'm thinking, 
Every time you let go of thought is a very meaningful moment. It, it has tremendous impact on breaking that habit. And so in meditation, you just content to do it whenever you can, whenever you can. That's part of it. Sometimes, if it just seems like it's just, you do it and just you keep get pulled into your thoughts so much, then sometimes you need to kind of um, uh, uh, be a little bit more, um, uh, uh, kind of arouse a little bit of uh, determination. Uh, be a little bit more like the warrior. Okay, I keep doing this. Am I just, I'm not going to be complacent with it. I'm going to really sit up straight, more straighter than usual, and really be alert, really pay attention here. And even though I think meditation is supposed to make me calm, I'm not going to even try to make myself calm. I'm just going to really try to be alert to notice as soon as I wander off into thought. So you start getting a handle of what's going on. And once you start getting a handle on it, then you can start relaxing after, you know, once you get a handle on it. But you might have to temporarily kind of practice with much more determination. Um, so, so I'll say more about uh, relevant to you as we go along. But I'd like to hear from one or two more people down there. Um, actually, I was thinking about something happened this afternoon on the people I saw. So when I started thinking about the people I saw, and I experienced this physical sensation. So Experience this, what? Uh, the physical, this tightness. Tightness, yes. Tightness in my chest, because I know the person I saw that makes me feel anxious. <laughs> so that is kind of, um, so the, when I experienced that tightness, so I kind of shift my attention from thought to my yes. uh, physical sensation. So... So I was wondering, in terms of this process, I know today we focus on thoughts, okay? Yeah. Um, but in terms of attention, where to focus on in general? I mean, um, focus on thoughts or focus on sensation or if emotion come up, do we focus on emotion? So that's kind of a question I have. Great, yeah. good. And that's what I'll talk about a little bit as well when I talk in more, more detail about the instructions around thinking. But the uh, thing to say right now is that um, thinking is a... Is a uh, complex process that involves it isn't just a dis- those insubstantial words or images that go through the process of thinking involves much of who we are it does well involve our body uh, you have to be very attention has to be very very precise very, very very concentrated and still but almost every thought you have will have a physical aspect to it physical sensation that goes along with it so there's physical aspects sometimes it's quite obvious you know, tightness or something in the chest um, there's usually often an emotional component to uh, thinking as well. Uh, it might be very subtle, but it might be there. Um, and there might be an energetic aspect as well. So as we start paying attention to, the, um, to thinking, then naturally we start becoming aware of the bigger picture that's more than just the, the content. And so what you pointed out, the, the tightness in your chest, that's part of that bigger package that includes the thought, the thought, it, the thought includes. So I'll talk more in a little bit. But one more. It may, be, it may be another time then. So, um, oh, one more, okay. Part of the time I was seeing uh, like pictures flashing, like movie, like half a dream. Would you define it thinking or? Yes. So uh, movies, images, visualizations that happen uh, is considered uh, in Buddhism as a form of thought. It's not verbal thoughts. Some people think more in images than they do with words. And that's how they process things. And uh, so a lot of the same things are true there. As you pay attention to that imagery, uh, what, you're, what, what, you're, what the images are are not important for us, but rather what else is part of that package. Are there feelings, emotions as part of it? Is there body sensations as part of it? Tightening in the body, whatever. Um, and then how much energy is, it, is there in the, in the images? Is it, it seems very energetic, very clear, very bright, or is it very faint and distant? Um, is it really close? Are you kind of really pulled into it and kind of living in it? Are you on that boat, uh, the movie boat? Or are you kind of just watching it from a distance? There's so much to notice besides the pictures that are going on. But some people think in images. And so you could just call it thinking or you can call it seeing as you wish. So um, thinking is a hugely important part of human life. And... But in, in meditation practice, one of the things we're trying to do is to not be pulled along in these boats. And uh, one, of the, one of the many reasons for that is that chances are pretty high that the stress 
we feel in our life, the suffering we feel in our life, the anxiety and many things that are, we're trying to deal with through meditation are perpetuated or strengthened or, or catalyzed, uh, uh, triggered by thinking, what we're thinking about or seeing and all that in our mind. And so as we start getting a handle on how to be mindful of thinking, it has a big impact on this, uh, the rest of our life, other aspects of our life. Um, it's not always easy. Some people have a very hard time noticing anything to do with thinking. Their thinking is very shy. As soon as they bring their attention to focus on it, it just kind of evaporates. And so, well, you know, um, some people uh, have very little uh, awareness of what they're thinking about. Uh, some people, it's very clear. They live in their world of thoughts in a very clear way. That's an important part of their life. So, you know, just different ways of being. One is not better or, or worse or right or wrong, just how it is for us. So, when thinking um, arises in meditation, and it's relatively easy to let go of it, then you're encouraged, just let go of it and come back to your breathing. Sooner or later, it's not going to be so easy to let go of your thinking. And that uh, takes two forms. One is you simply can't let go of it. The mind's charging ahead, thinking that doesn't want to stop at all. You can't just let go of it. And the other is you might be able to let go of it momentarily, but as soon as you let go of it for a moment, it comes back right away. It comes back, it can repeatedly comes back. So when either, either one of those two things happen, then you want to uh, quite contently let go of your breathing, paying attention to your breathing, and then focus on this phenomena of thinking. Just look at, like you're looking at right in the eye. Thinking, I see you. And if, if you're here and the thinking is there, then you're free of it to some degree. If you're, if you're looking at, if you are the thinking, if you think that you are the thought, then you're not outside of it. You're not in the riverbank. So you just kind of look at straight on thinking. And saying the word thinking in your mind, very softly, gently, can help you kind of look it in the eye and say, I see you. I know that this is what's going on now. So it's a very clear cognizance of the fact that thinking is going on. And sometimes that's enough for thinking just to evaporate. And part of the reason for that is that uh, in order for th- thoughts to turn, turn into thinking and persistent thinking, there has to be fuel for them, right, to put energy into them. And if you clearly see it for what it is, thinking, and you have enough, enough attention that's, that's free of the thinking, but see, you see it, thinking, in a way, you're not fueling it anymore. You're not involved in it anymore. And if you're not involved, it dissipates usually, if it's relatively mild. Sometimes thinking is quite powerful. If you come to sit here, meditate with us someday, and you've just robbed the local bank and the police are chasing after you, chances are you can't let go of your thoughts that easily. You know, they'd be kind of spinning along really fast. So certain, certain activities, certain things happen in your life, and you're just like, woo, 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 you can't put it to stop. That's normal. So, but then the, the task in meditation is to, there's two things you can do. You can just keep letting go and come back to your breath and you let the breath help calm you. And as you get calmer, that energy of thinking might dissipate. The other thing you can do is you can actually turn and pay more careful attention to the phenomena of thinking, the process of thinking, and start noticing different aspects of it, like we did in this meditation. For the purpose of meditation, we're not generally, we're almost never interested in the content. So the story that goes with the thinking, we not focus on. That's for other, other times and places, uh, but not for meditation. So you can notice there were things we talked about. You can notice uh, the physical aspect of it. And when I can't let go of my thinking very easily, I often find that there's a sense of pressure or tightness in the area where I I call my brain. And if I can let go of my thoughts, and as soon as I let go of it, if that pressure is there, I just pump out another thought. And what helps me is if I go feel the tension in my brain or my forehead or my eyes or wherever it might be, and uh, relax it. If I relax it, then the pressure to think is not so great anymore. And then it's easier to let go of it, and then after a while, I I might might not think so much and and come back. But but it's like this this factory of tension or pressure or whatever, tightness, that as long as it's there, its it's job is to pump out thoughts. And so you have to somehow address that. And so that's why it's very helpful. When When thinking is very powerful, it's very helpful to look and see what's going on in the body. 
And when you find something in the body, then you can let go of your thinking, looking at your thoughts. Then you just focus for a while on the physical aspect of it. And the bodily thing, the tensions there. Just be the mindfulness of the body around that. If it's not easy to relax, don't make a big deal engineering project out of trying to relax. That's not meditation. If it's easy to relax, do it. But if it's not easy, then be content that what we're doing in mindfulness is just being present for things. Bringing our presence to be present. Feel what it's like. And as long as you're present, you're doing the practice. Nothing has to change. You don't have to fix anything. Or you just want to be present for how things actually are. There also could be an emotional aspect to uh, the thinking. So, people who plan a lot in meditation, uh, there's a very strong correlation, many of them, um, for many of them, the planning arises out of uh, anxiety, fear, apprehension. There's some feeling of anxiety around the planning. There's other causes of planning as well. It can be excitement or kind of delight or creativity or different things. But the majority of times, probably you'll find, or people find, it has to do with some anxiety. In that case, the anxiety, the fear, is the factory for the thinking. And you can let go of your thoughts as much as you want, but the factory is still going to over- work overtime because its factory is on. So, you know, so what you need to do is to really then do mindfulness of emotions. Feel the fear, as we talked about last week. Fear, fear, anxiety. Note it, be aware of it, and feel it in the body. As we t- all the things we talked about last week about emotions, you do that. And then... It's kind of like the thinking sometimes is like the flag that says, hey, you, pay attention over here. And then we pay attention to the flag. But really what's being, what the flag is there is they pay attention to what's holding the flag, the factory, the emotion. And so we can just forget about the thoughts and come back and feel. Both uh, the body, the physical sensations connected to thinking, and the emotions happen in real time, in the current, here and now. Thought, thinking also happens in the present moment. But um, the thinking so often, the content often has to do with the past or the future or some other place. And if you're connected to your body or if you're connected to your emotions, then you're here. If you're caught up in the world of your thoughts, in a sense, you might be somewhere else. So we're trying to be here. And so the, the, the emotional aspect of thinking, the physical aspect of thinking is a great support to just being present. It helps anchor us in the present moment. There could also be ener- energetic uh, experiences with thinking. I find sometimes I can be very, sitting in meditation and very calm, very centered. My center of kind of gravity, my center of being or presence seems to be low down here, very nice feeling. And then um, some really juicy thought will bubble up. And I'll get into that boat. And as I do that, I get into that boat, I get involved in it, I can feel that sense of aliveness or, uh, or vitality, whatever that I have, going, move, start very quickly move up up into my upper chest, sometimes into my head. And it's like, you know, my, I feel almost like I'm a little bit top-heavy then. It's like this is where my, my aliveness, my vitality, the energy is up here. And so then if I relax and let go, sometimes I feel it go down again. And if you're down here, your vitality, your energy is down lower. Uh, you're more balanced, lower center of gravity. It, fe- and it feels more st- stable. It's easier to relax. So it's interesting to watch how the sense of energy or or the vitality or aliveness in your body shifts and changes depending on what you're thinking about. Uh, occasionally, it's useful to um, be a little more precise in your noting besides saying just thinking, thinking. If it's really obvious and you don't have to think about it, then you can say, oh, planning. Just planning, planning. You name it for planning or remembering, remembering. And you see it that way. And that helps come somehow break the seduction or the involvement. There's one more aspect of thinking that is a very helpful uh, perspective on it. And that is part of the package of all the different things going on as we think is also our interest in it. And you can notice, you know, how you can, as you, as you track yourself thinking, you can notice how interested are you? You know, boy, am I ever interested. This is the best. This is the best fantasy I've ever had. You know, this is like, or uh, it could be that uh, there's kind of a negative interest where you're kind of, where we kind of aghast. <laughs> How could I be thinking this? And um, you know, it's kind of this kind of negative interest, but it's kind of an interest. We're kind of caught in it. We're kind of engaged in it somehow. And sometimes it's the interest that perpetuates it, fuels the thinking. And sometimes it's very helpful to notice the degree of interest that might be there. 
Sometimes that interest has a physical feeling of reaching forward almost, leaning forward, holding on, wanting, getting involved. You kind of feel the mind sometimes kind of almost lean into, grab onto, want to get involved in thinking. So, um, um, if it's relatively mild, the thinking, then the task is just let go of it. If it doesn't let go of easily, then we just very calmly include this as part of the meditation practice and just no thinking, thinking. If it uh, stay, persists over time or keeps reoccurring over and over again, then very calmly, stay in your place best you can, kind of look around and notice what else is happening besides the content of what you're thinking about. So notice the physical aspects, the tension that might be there. And if you're thinking a lot, chances are there's some tension or pressure. Uh, notice the emotional the emotions that are part of it. They could be very pleasant emotions. They could be very difficult emotions. Um, you don't want to be seduced by the pleasant ones. Think like finally, they get to have nice emotions. Um, the pleasant ones will keep you caught up in thought as much as the, the difficult emotions. For the purposes of mindfulness, you, what you're trying very hard to do is not to get caught by anything. You don't want to get on the emotion boat either. You can do that other times, but not in meditation. Because it's something much more important to do in meditation. And then you could also notice um, the energy qualities connected to it, the intensity of it, the, the, tone, the inner voice. Any of you surprised by the tone of your inner voice when you like to pay attention? At least one of you? Only one? More than one? Two? Three? Four? <laughs> uh, occasionally there are people who, who are surprised and they realize not only they're surprised by the tone, but they're also surprised by whose voice it is. They realize it's not their own. Sometimes it's their, a, a parent's voice, or sometimes it's some teacher, some, usually a difficult teacher, that somehow they've internalized. You can internalize different, sometimes these voices. And we realize how much we kind of get we're entangled also with other people in our inner mind. So sometimes seeing all this can help us become free of it. And, um, and that's the task of meditation, is to become free of all this. And as you become freer, you'll be more relaxed, more at ease. And you, you'll drop into deeper meditations as a, as a consequence. So any questions about that? Comments or questions, concerns? I guess it's related to my previous comment where it seems like I am unable to step back from my thoughts or body emotions. I can sort of step back. Maybe I'm stepping into my thoughts to watch the other two things, but... It's just, I've been, I've been Maybe I'm stepping into my thoughts to look at my body and emotions and ah. when I try to look at my thoughts, it doesn't work too well. Do you have any guidance on that's a That's a very good point. Some people confuse mindfulness with thoughtfulness because there's so much how they, how they orient themselves and understand their world is by thinking about things. So we, people live in that world of thinking so much. That's where they, you know, the residents, if the, if the mail carrier is going to bring you mail, they bring it to, you know, 200 thinking place because that's where you live. <laughs> and um, the um, um, so mindfulness is not thinking about something. Uh, so, you know, I don't know if this is a good example. I apologize if it's not, but it's like uh, uh, thinking about a massage and getting massage is not the same thing. And you can get a wonderful massage and if, you, if you're thinking about what the experience is, that's very different than kind of kind of sinking into the muscles, allowing you to really feel the fingers of the masseuse. It's tactile. It's very present. You don't need to think in order to feel a tactile experience of the masseuse. You can look at a sunset. You don't have to think about the sunset to see how, spa- how, how grand it is, how wonderful it is. It can be a silent mind. Or when I went to, I went to, to, to uh, uh, see a symphony many years ago. And, um, and during the first half, before the intermission, I was uh, understanding everything that was going on through my thinking. And we had a good view of the orchestra pit. And so I was look, listening to music and kind of enjoying it, but I was looking at how the violins were being moved and the, fl- the flutes were going this way and commenting and judging and thinking. And, and I was so involved, involved in this world of thinking about what I was looking at. I realized after a while that I wasn't as deeply connected to the music as I could be. Because I, so what I did was I closed my eyes. And as I closed my eyes, the thinking about the musicians and everything faded away. 
and I could really absorb the music. And the music wasn't thinking about the music. And after the intermission, then I was settled enough, and then I could open my eyes and watch as well as listen without being caught by the world of thoughts. So there's a kind of silent quality to mindfulness. It's kind of a silent awareness. And um, so, um, so it's very important to make that distinction. And that silent awareness is intelligent. You, you're, you know, if you're fully present, you kind of, you kind of register it. Kind of, you kind of take it in. You kind of know what's going on. You don't have to think about what, what's, what's happening so much. Does that make sense? Yeah, but how do I turn off the thinking so I can ah, listen to the other If stuff? you can't turn it off, then, um, then your job is to, be, is to study it. To become uh, become very become uh, very familiar with what it feels like to have your thinking on all the time. What does it feel like physically? What does it feel like energetically? Um, uh, one, one of the things to look at when you're looking at incessant thinking is uh, notice if the mind is tired. The um, uh, you know this poor thinking mind is most of people's many people's thinking minds are exhausted, <laughs> so weary. <laughs> you know it's been going on and on and on forever. You know, they don't, we don't give, them a, give it a break. So you can notice that, you know, what's the, what's the, uh, what does it feel like? What's the, inner, what's the subjective sense of it, always doing that and being that way? A very interesting question to ask. And this is, um, sometimes in Buddhism, we ask ourselves uh, contemplative questions. And um, I'll, I'll give you an example of a little contemplation. We'll do it together. So just as you are, close your eyes. You don't have to change anything. Just close your eyes. And for a moment, just see if you can connect to your belly or deep in your torso. And I'm going to ask a question. And don't think about the question, but see if some response bubbles up from inside. What would you be experiencing if you weren't thinking? Okay. So, what came up for you? Yes, I heard the water flowing and heard some cars go by. Ah, and was that nice? The water was the car is not so nice. But yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that's nice. Now what happens is occasionally uh, when you ask that kind of question for people, uh, sometimes the thinking is really a protection from feeling. And uh, because if you think about stuff enough, you kind of, you know, or make stories or fantasy. Some people go to fantasy so they don't have to be present for life because life is, you know, difficult. You have to f- have feelings and emotions and and if we've had difficult trauma in our lives, those emotions are kind of some deeply embedded in us. So sometimes if, uh, when you ask that kind of question, sometimes, a deep, sometimes um, what we fight, can find out is that how, how much the incessant thinking is a protection. And, um, and uh, that can open up an interesting door, window into what's going on. Um, I'm not saying that's your case, but that's, you know, that's one of the things to notice. Um, you have to be very careful when you meditate that you don't get caught in the trap of wanting something to go away. Caught in the trap, caught in the trap of judging and saying this shouldn't be there. Um, always a st- the, 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 the default or the basic approach of medita- mindfulness meditation is to know it and know it really well. And the a lot of wisdom comes from familiarity which is bad news because familiarity means you have to hang out with it for a long time. So, for your case, you, know, you, have, to be, you have to get really familiar with that part of yourself. And so, exploring in different ways uh, could be helpful. And, and that's an example of something like that. It's such a big part of you, perhaps. Is, um, it's also good to go talk with friends. Go for a walk with a friend and say, you know, I have this interesting thing. This thinking mind that's incessant. And uh, can I just kind of talk to you about it and explore it with you? Maybe you can ask me questions about it and just kind of find different angles in to understand it and uh, different perspectives and get familiar with it. How can I distinguish between 
Uh, how can I distinguish in between or sorting out that I'm exhausted and tired of having thought too much? Or if I'm, am I truly tired? I mean, it, this is different tiredness. And yes. I find I'm just battling a lot, like checking out and not being here and not being in the body. And the next thing is, boom, I'm going to sleep every time. And this last exercise, which was very short, very, very short, I was able not to think and only staying with the movement of my belly the entire time. Mm. Is that good? Yes. That's <laughs> great. That's great. But the falling asleep is so immense. Yeah. And, and then when I think about that, then I think that two out of three Americans, I understand, have problems falling asleep because they're thinking too much. Now, I have the opposite. I'm falling asleep too fast. Mm -hmm. They, um, so I also, I don't know what the, what the number is, proportions are, but the high percentage of, percentage of Americans are also sleep deprived. Mm -hmm. and, that, uh, yeah. So um, I like to say that peop some people need to meditate more than they need to med uh, need to sleep more than they need to meditate. Well, I, I sleep seven hours, so I think it's plenty. So I shouldn't be tired, and yet I'm checking out in the meditation and go, I think like this and Could the be. whole thing. I can't yeah, it's hard to, it's hard, it's hard to know. People have different sleep needs. Some people need nine hours of sleep, oh. and. Um, and that's normal for some people. So what you might try doing is giving yourself more more sleep uh, for for a week. Give yourself nine hours or ten hours, and then uh, give as much as your possibly body could use, and then try to meditate. Yeah. And then see if you keep falling asleep. If you keep falling asleep and you know you've had all the sleep you need, you know, take a nap during the middle of the day before you meditate. Just <laughs> get all the sleep you can get. And if you keep falling asleep, then there could be some other uh, uh, other things going on. And there's a variety of things that, are, that could be going on. Uh, one is that there could be, um, I'm not saying this, any of these is yours, but things to explore. One is that it could be that you're excessively complacent. Kind of complacent, complacent kind of, you've kind of given up, or kind of, there's no real sense of inner life or vitality or interest in life. And, mm -hmm. you know, once you kind of let go of the incessant kind of doing and thinking, there's no deeper, deeper kind of motivation or aliveness there that to fall back on. And so you fall asleep. Another is that falling asleep a lot is, is a very powerful protection that some people use so they don't have to be present for themselves because being present means they have to feel their emotions and some people's emotions are quite difficult. They could be deep, deep, you know, all kinds of difficult anger or fear or a lot of things, sadness, grief. I think that's it. more the case, the checking out, like yeah. avoiding. And so... Would that be the same like avoiding? It's avo it can be avoiding, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's where that question... What if, you know, if this, if, 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 if this falling, if you weren't falling asleep, what would you be experiencing? If you ask that question in the right way, um, then some people kind of like, something like dawns on them, oh, then I'd be really sad. And, oh, and then, then the instructions would be, okay, now start paying attention to sadness. You've, you've connected to something really important. Um, and, um, In the medita our meditation circles, we have a lot of respect for the, the when, when, when people fall asleep because it's a protection, we have a lot of respect for that. And uh, we're not in a hurry to overcome that, but to kind of, in a kind of a slow, gentle way, keep doing the best, exploring it, being present. Don't want to bet you pop out of it too quickly uh, because there's an inner wisdom that knows when you're ready. And when you're ready, it comes. Um, in your in your booklet, you you mentioned that um, you know it, it works even when it doesn't work. <laughs> and then when you were um, you were asking you know to go and to and to think about um, about your thoughts you know as they arise to to look for your thoughts. So I was thinking about looking for my thoughts, unaware that I was thinking about looking for my thoughts, which was finding my thoughts and catching myself in it. So it was actually completing the the uh, instruction. The the point is that um, I've noticed in my life, um, even though I meditate and I don't think I meditate, I I don't believe it. You know, I mean, I've I probably never made it meditated, 
I mean, you, you, you do go through the. You mean you, you go through the form? I go through the form and sit and and uh, and and follow the instructions. But um, but I've noticed, um, although the the actual content of my life hasn't changed. You know, I'm still at a job. I think it stinks in it. You know, and and uh, it's just a horrible situation. I feel wonderful. <laughs> And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, um, well, you know, um, what's, what's, what's been done here? What's, what's, what's been changed here? And um, actually, uh, the, the content is the same, and, but the perception and the uh, awareness are different. And uh, I think I could... Uh, Actually, continue uh, to the point of uh, my demise, quite content. And, and uh, even though I've never been able to meditate. Well, c- careful, meditation might spoil, might, might spoil it then. <laughs> we, don't want, we don't want to spoil what's going on. <laughs> okay. So there we go. <laughs> The, um, so we say sometimes in our circles, meditation circles, that the point of mindfulness is not to have a, a new kind, different kind of experience. It's to see our experience in a new way. So that's what you've learned to do. You've learned a new perspective, even though it stinks. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah, and um, it's related to sleep. When when I'm trying to clear my mind, sometimes I get seem to get to stage which is similar to what. I seem to feel when I'm falling asleep. I don't actually uh, fall asleep when I'm doing this, but it seems to be somewhat similar. So am I just getting too lethargic? Should I up my energy level, or should I, what should I be doing in a um, case like that? Yeah, if, uh, it's quite common, if I understand you, is that it's quite common that uh, as people get calmer in meditation, the calm becomes sup- soporific. There's no dropping of energy. And then sometimes when we get calm enough that the mind actually begins to drift off into dreamlike states, much like sleeping. Mm-hmm. And when, uh, when, when sleepiness or dullness or, uh, starts happening like, or dreamlike states start happening like that, because you're too calm, then um, it, isn't that, um, it isn't that you're too calm by itself, but the, uh, calm needs to be balanced with energy. And so um, if there's too much calm without enough energy to balance it, people will fall asleep or go dreamlike. So the thing is to bring more energy in to balance it out. And sometimes it's as easy as sitting up straighter. Um, sometimes uh, people like to open their eyes, but sometimes it's applying a little bit more, awakening a little bit more mental energy, mental effort. I usually open my eyes then because that seems to sort of bring me back yes. and quicker. But is that, is that okay? Or? It's great, yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah. So there's one more thing. I hope this is a lot, this thinking. Um, a couple more things to say here. One is that um, if this seems too complicated, uh, it's really enough to, for a long time just to stay with the breath. Just let go of thoughts the best you can, stay with the breath. Don't, you, know, you don't have to kind of do all this stuff, exploration of thoughts, and if it seems too complicated. Just that it's something to kind of have in the back of your mind in its own time and place. You'll, you'll remember, hopefully remember that instruction and it'll become relevant. You don't have to be racing around trying to understand everything. Just keep it, stay, stay at ease and relax. Keep coming back to your breath. Use your breath. And then when it's really compelling, your physical sensations, really compelling, your emotions, really compelling, your world of thinking, then maybe you begin exploring it in this mindful way. Um, but, if, but if you're exploring thinking, there's one more interesting phenomenon around thinking. And I'll say it this way. If... Um, someone walked next to me, talking to me as much as I talk to myself. I'd worry about them. And I would beg them to stop. I would pay them to stop. I'd probably call the authorities because I was worried about them. You know what I mean? And not only because they talk so much, because it's, it's so, so repetitive. You know, I can't believe you know, how much the person is saying the same thing over again and over again and over again. And, uh, you know, what's going on? And, um, but what's most amazing, 
I think, is that we could say the same thing to ourselves 500 times, and it can be as interesting the 500th time as the first time. I think we're the ones who should report to the authorities. <laughs> we stay interested. A healthy person would lose interest. And um, so what is that interest like? What's that about? And I think that a, a, um, a, a, a high percentage of the time, uh, the thinking, what keeps the thinking us interested, all that, you know, is because a lot of the, those thoughts are self-referential. They have to do with our favorite subject, which is me, myself, and mine. And so, in investigation of thoughts, it's also to look a little bit. This is a little bit looking at the content now, but you see to what degree, a uh, very simple thing, to what degree is the content all about me? And just notice that. You don't have to judge it or say that's bad or wrong, but just to see that very clearly. And if you see how regular that is, just, to, just the awareness of that will begin shifting it. So, um, uh, I had a little sense of this um, when I lived in Japan. Uh, I was living in a monastery in Japan and I was learning Japanese. And I basically try to speak Japanese like I speak English, which doesn't work so well because they have a different, a whole different structure for the sentences. But, um, but the, um, um, the Japanese uh, are, don't very often use uh, pronouns like I and you and we. They, 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 could, they have pronouns they could use but they don't often use it and you just understand in context what people are saying. So like, if we're all going to go now, it's time to go, I'd say, um, rather than saying, let's go, I would say, go. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't say us, let us go, just go. Or, I'm going now, We'd rather say, going, you know, it's clear, I'm the one who's going, everyone else is, everyone's is sitting down, you don't say, <laughs> don't have to say I, you know, everybody going. And so, it's kind of like that. And um, so they don't, they don't use the, the I pronoun very much in Japan. And the usual way of saying it is three syllables long. Can you believe it? <laughs> you, know, you know, we have this very one syllable, right? They have three syllables. It takes a while to get out of your mouth. And, um, but anyway, so here I was learning Japanese, trying to speak it, and uh, speaking it like I speak English, which meant every sentence began with I. <laughs> <laughs> And so I'd be saying, watashi wa, that's the way, how you say I, is watashi. So then you have to add the wa afterwards, so it's four syllables. Watashi wa. And, um, and, uh, and the monks would look at me, and I got so self-conscious, because I became so aware of how much my language was self-referential with I, that I had no idea when I was just in America speaking English, because we all do it, it's invisible to us. And it was very instructive to me. And uh, it helped free me up quite a bit from a certain kind of a little bit, that attachment to self and self-preoccupation, self-referential. So you might look at your thoughts that way as well. See, what's going on there now? And, and, what's, and then if once you see the self-referential nature of it, then there might be more going on than just the thoughts of self. There might be emotions connected to that wonderful self, that self-referential. There might be body sensations, might be clinging and tightness, all kinds of things going on. So there's a lot to notice. So the hope is that when you do mindfulness practice, you begin really valuing and loving, noticing what's going on. Like you're a naturalist and your, 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 field, your field studies are yourself. So I hope that's clear. And there is a, a handout for today that uh, goes over the instructions for mindfulness of thinking. It's on the table as you go out. Uh, with, uh, so please take that. And um, also there is, I think, a chapter in my book on thinking that you might also, if you want to explore. And uh, I want you to try out these instructions during the week and uh, see how they work for you both in meditation. But you might also start uh, focusing on thinking in some other times and seeing what you can learn about yourself is beyond the content of the thoughts when you're driving your car or talking to friends or whatever. And then next week, uh, we're going to talk about uh, something uh, very different, and somewhat, somewhat very different, and, but very profound in Buddhist context, which is mindfulness of the mind.